Oh, Dave, how you doing? Doing good, man. How you doing this morning, man? I'm waking up. It's a cool and rainy <laughs> day here in Texas, which is a nice day to be inside. Yeah. Where are you at? Uh, this morning, I'm in uh, South Dakota. Wow. So it's it's not that far away for Western standards. So it's uh, um, we just drove up last night. Uh, left about seven o'clock, and we have some site visits this morning at a tailwater fishery, and then another site visit at a, another ranch, and then head home this afternoon. So, very nice, man. Any big Thanksgiving plans? Yeah, we have some friends coming up for uh, Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll fry a turkey and roast a duck. So, oh, and and make a meatless option for our vegetarian vegan friends. Uh, so that's a little bit harder to make. You know, I went to a conference in Austin this past week, and uh, the only thing they served us at the conference was vegan, vegan fare. Yeah. But it was all this, this, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know how they made it, but it was like a meat substitute type stuff yeah. like they, that they made into fajitas and they made it all this stuff. And if somebody hadn't told me what they you know, that it was it wasn't meat i probably wouldn't have even noticed yeah, it tasted great and it was all like in a tex-mex so you're putting everything in tacos it's like you know I mean, yeah it's like yeah what's the difference yeah yeah and it tasted it tasted really good it was kind of it was kind of funny though people people watching people's reactions when they figured it out like what what this wasn't meat <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that was great yeah we we ended up uh we had the some of the same friends over last year for thanksgiving and um not a whole lot of people cook for them because uh, they're kind of hard to cook for for Thanksgiving. But last year, it took us about three days to kind of cook something. But when we cooked it, it was great. It's just it took that long to kind of prep food and let it sit and then be ready to prep it again. It's almost as if you had to emulate the uh, processes happening in the stomach and creating a pro proteins of an animal or something. So... Mm. All right. So you expecting a big crowd today? I never know how to who to expect now. Uh, so used to be we'd send out the invites and you'd expect about the certain size crowd and stuff. But now we always get a lot of surprises from people. So that's <laughs> nice. oh, last week we had we had about a I think we had twenty some people on the line last week, and a lot of them were folks that I hadn't recognized the email addresses on. So that's good. Cool. That is good. That's great, man. Well, I'm looking forward to it. How long do I have? Like 40 minutes or something? There's an hour blocked off for this. Yeah, it's an, it's an hour blocked off. Uh, we usually go uh, a half hour for the technical talk and then some questions, and then we still do inspiration after it. But we're pretty flexible on time. So if you talk longer or shorter, it's no big deal. So I, I may I may talk longer, but it won't be that, that much. Good. I'm going to turn off my screen for just a second and I'll be right back. All right. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Greg and Andrea. Morning. Morning, Brett. Hey, morning, Brock. Morning. Brock, you're in Virginia, right? Uh, yes, sir. Good. 
it's light and bright out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh I guess so. You're in Colorado. Yeah, well, I'm in South Dakota today working. Uh, but uh, yeah, so and uh, Greg, who's on the line, is from South Dakota, and uh, Brett's on the line, but he's from uh, Nebraska, and I believe he's an hour between us. So uh, okay. Morning, Brad. Morning, Dave. You're in the dark, David. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have uh, uh, one of the guys working with us, uh, Mr. Jack, who's sleeping in the hotel room. So trying to keep it dark for him if he can sleep through my talking. So I doubt it. I doubt it. Yeah. He was making comments about sharing hotel rooms with you, and I, I regaled him about the time that I, I shared a room with you at the conference in Mississauga, how I got about two hours sleep that night. <laughs> I think you got more sleep than I did, actually. It's probably true. There's Matt Stom, and y'all ready to talk, Matt? Yes, sir, Brad, for as, uh, as long as you can stand me. Yep. <laughs> That'll be quite a while, Matt. I don't have to listen to you as much as I do other people, so I'm happy to listen to you. Other Man, I, got, so much. I, I owe you a review of that investment strategy. I apologize. I'm, no, no problem. Right now. I was, I'm up. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, Dave, I can start whenever you want. Uh, Brad, do you have any any uh, reason to wait? Or are we good to go? Um, I'd wait a couple more minutes because we do get a lot of people chiming in at about you know sort of several minutes after, and it's only eight oh two. So, Matt, if you can bear with us, give us a couple more minutes, please. No problem. See, there's more chiming in now. <laughs> Come and say hi. Come on. Up, up, up. Yeah, uh, I wasn't thinking much about it, Brad, but this morning we kind of have the match show because we have a, a Stallman and Kondratius that will be talking after Stallman. Uh, so, wow. Yeah, we got mats. As long as we don't have the doormat as well, we're okay. That's right. <laughs> Well, what are you doing? If you want to come up again, come say hi. Say hi. Come up. Come up. <laughs> All right. Do we want to let let uh, Matt Stallman get started? Sure. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, I'll go. Ahead. I'll go ahead and share my screen and roll through my picture show. So let's see here. Um, work. Uh, okay, can you see my screen now? Yep, yeah. very good. All right, I think I got it ready to roll. Okay, so today uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about, oh, good grief, I think the last five years of my life, Dave, uh, it seems like. <laughs> and, and for those of you guys, y'all have known me and seen me present on the Bodark Lake Mitigation Project, uh, you'll see a lot of familiar slides in here, Dave, you'll see some that you know, that, that came up at the end of construction celebration. Uh, but I just kind of build on this presentation over the years and I just can't help but leaving some of these slides in here because they're some of my favorite photos. So uh, for those of you who have never heard of this project before, I, I will give you the background and then we'll get into 
why it's been such an odyssey. Okay, so for Canadians, you guys know you're you're way up here somewhere off the top of my screen, uh, and then and then I'm way down here in Texas. The Bodark Lake Mitigation Project is right on the border with Oklahoma, and it's just outside of Dallas. And if you're old enough to remember that 1970s show, Dallas South Fork Ranch, where they filmed South Fork Ranch, is actually right there. So it's it's like classic classic North Texas uh, terrain and, and culture. The reason for the project, the reason we've been up there um, uh, doing our project for the last five years is that there's a huge demand for water going on in the Dallas and Fort Worth metroplex areas. Dallas and Fort Worth are not very far apart. These are the water districts that cover the Dallas Fort Worth region. Our client in this, in this project is the North Texas Municipal Water District. They have several lakes in that region. Most everything comes from surface water supply, but they are uh, expected to uh, continue to increase in population and increase in demand. Right now they serve 2 million people, but the demand is quickly exceeding the supplies. So you can see on this graph, all the different supplies that they have right now Bodark uh, Lake is, da, 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 where's that, the, the yellow one, yeah, yeah, the blue one, here we go. Bodark Lake, once it comes online, will basically close the gap in the, in the projected deficit, at least out till about 2030, 2032, maybe 10 years from now. And then they're gonna have to start finding additional things to come online, which they've already planned for. So it's a big deal. The, the project itself, the lake itself is a big deal and is really needed for the entire uh, Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex area. Here's the footprint of the lake. And you can see it's not just a, it's not just a lake in this project. There's a big pipeline that, that carries water. It's about 10 feet in diameter all the way down to a new water treatment facility in Leonard, Texas, and then on down the line to tie into North Texas Municipal Water District's water supply system. So big multi-billion dollar, I think it's over a billion dollar project. And our project uh, is the actual mitigation itself. So this project took decades to uh, to design and then an over a decade permit with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Those of you familiar with Clean Water Act and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, requirements under the Clean Water Act in order to get a permit to impact waters of the United States, you have to avoid and minimize those impacts to the maximum extent practical. And then whatever you you can't avoid and minimize, you have to somehow offset or mitigate. That's where Res comes in. The company I work for, uh, RES, we do we do all sorts of ecological restoration and green infrastructure all throughout the nation. One of the things that we do is we do mitigation sites for uh, infrastructure projects. We also do mitigation for banks. This is the is the the largest project that we have that we have undertaken, and may very well be one of the largest mitigation projects ever permitted by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. There are three mitigation sites associated with the lake. Um, the smallest is this little grassland mitigation site, which is a few hundred acres, about 300 acres of native grassland restoration and riparian corridors right along the lake's uh, eastern boundary, a really pretty site. The next largest is the upper Bodark Creek mitigation site, which is a couple thousand acres of bottomland hardwood riparian corridor restoration uh, right along uh, uh, Bodark Creek, which then forms Bodark Lake behind the dam. But the largest mitigation site is what used to be River by Ranch, uh, a, a privately held 15,000 acre ranch that is just downstream by about five miles from the dam. In fact, uh, Bodark Creek goes through the ranch on its way to the Red River, where it, uh, where, where it ties into the Red River. This is what River by Ranch looks like a little close up. You can kind of see the different colors representing different habitat types, the uh, dash lines representing the streams that we were restoring out there. And I'll show you more about that here in just a second. And this is that upper Bodark Creek mitigation site with existing uh, forestry areas, but a lot of reforestation that we had to do because they had been cleared 
for agriculture. So a major, major, major project. If you like numbers, uh, here's the breakdown on the actual acres and hectares. You know, I'm mean, being multinational, Brad. Hectares there as well, uh, miles and kilometers uh, of restoration for streams. And since this is, um, you know, this is primarily the uh, uh, river shared, and most of most of y'all are focused on stream restoration. I'll, I'll focus. I'll focus a lot on that. The stream restoration was was massive. I mean, it was a, a big chunk of of an entire watershed. Sixty nine miles of streams were either enhanced or restored. The restoration portion, which is about 24 miles or 38 kilometers, was almost all priority one. Have I got that right, David? Priority one restoration? Yeah, that's correct. Very good. See, after five years, I'm learning the lingo. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Okay, so let's start off with, with when we showed up to the site. So when we showed up to Riverbier Ranch, that 15,000 acre site, it literally looked like a scene out of Dallas. I mean, it, it was a, a working agricultural ranch, uh, complete with buildings that had been there for over a hundred years uh, and lots and lots of cattle, cattle everywhere, lots of cotton, uh, lots of grass, of improved pastures and lots of fencing and structures. This is the sale barn. Um, Dave knows that well because we lived in that sale barn for uh, quite a while uh, doing doing uh, design, which I'll talk about here in a minute. We had to move in trailers. We took over the existing infrastructure that was on the ranch after the farmers and ranchers were done with their final harvests, and we totally renovated it and made it into living quarters and office space, and we got to work. So we designed all the way from August 2018 to June 2019 uh, all of the habitat restoration work we were going to do and all of that stream restoration work we were going to do. And then we started moving in equipment. Well, actually, we started moving in equipment as we did the design. One thing about that design, and, and, and then we, we also started doing site preparation, but one thing about that design, I will say, was that design was iterative. So as we were, we would design a section. So there'd be, there's five sections, six sections, actually, six sections now on the ranch. And we would do all of the design work, habitats and streams on one section. We'd start construction there, and then we'd move to the next section and so forth and so on. So so design was design was always like one section ahead of construction. And that was pretty pretty helpful because it allowed us to figure out what we needed to tweak as we continued on in that design. So as construction was going and we started to see things that we needed to do a little differently, whatnot, that informed the design for the next section and so forth and so on. But before we could get to the you know full bore construction, we had to do a lot of invasive species management, uh, a lot of herbicide on uh, invasive species, and then we burned it. And we burned and burned and burned that ranch until we got rid of all the crop residue and all of the uh, non-native uh, vegetables we could. And then we prepared the soil, we ripped it, and we started planting trees. Trees take the longest. Uh, you know, to grow of anything that we plant out there. So we wanted to get trees in the ground as quickly as we could. We planted over 6 million trees to date on that project. Every winter, we plant over a million. And this last winter before the one coming up, we planted about 2 million. So about 6.3 million trees in the ground so far. Every one of those trees planted by hand by an incredible group of people. And then uh, we moved about a million cubic yards of dirt uh, between all of the uh, uh, depressions that we've created out there for or for uh, wetlands, the low profile berms we've created to slow down surface water runoff, and of course the stream restoration itself. So let's look at some of the habitats. So uh, wetland restoration, you can tell from the air, you know, after we're done with, uh, with uh, slowing down water, we can restore a lot of these wetland areas. A lot of it we had to go in by hand and plant different uh, different plugs and whatnot in order to revegetate. But most of it came back from the native seed bank, seed bank. And today you have a mosaic of water across that landscape that 150 years of agriculture had 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 worked very hard to control and to drain. Uh, we just basically turned the clock back on how water is, 
is uh, held on the landscape. We also did a ton of native grassland restoration, native grassland seeding. These are tall grasses. Those of you familiar with the tall grass prairie, Dave, I think you said you're in you're in South Dakota today. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, you're probably familiar. You you're you're in, you're in this country. Uh, you know where we're at at River by Ranch is the southern end of the tall grass prairie. Uh, North Dakota would be the north end, but we restored uh, grasses, you know, the, the native grass system out there that's probably you know, six feet tall or so, and it look, it's looking gorgeous today. And then there's the forest re, uh, restoration that we've been working on. Over 8,000 acres, uh, that's 6.3 million trees, uh, is spread across over 8,000 acres of forested wetland habitats and upland forest habitats and riparian corridors. And you can kind of get a feel for how those trees are doing. Um, you know, these are some of the ones that we planted in the first first wave, first million, and they're already getting up head high. Uh, sometimes they're even, you know, depending upon the species, they might even be uh, 20 to 30 feet tall uh, today. So I'm going to talk about the streams, though, now, because it is all about the water. Uh, this is what the stream system was being restored to. So they're 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 sort of five major systems draining this draining this uh, this entire ranch. Uh, Bodark Creek goes through what we call a, a wetlands reserve program zone, a, a couple thousand acres that's that's uh, basically been preserved in the bottom of Bodark Creek's floodplain. Uh, most most of the eastern part of the ranch drains into Bodark Creek or the Red River. We've got Hunt Bottom Branch, we've got Willow Branch, Black Branch, and then over here on the, on the far western side, we've got Ragsdale Creek. So all of those stream systems, all their tributaries, that's where we focused our restoration efforts. When we got there, the streams looked pretty much what you would expect, uh, degraded. Uh, there were some that served as decent refer re reference reaches like Black Branch. And we were working to uh, to restore them back to that to that uh, initial condition or something sim uh, similar to that condition. But most of the streams on the on the on the ranch were straightened, ditched, and uh, you had agriculture or improved pasture grasses right up to their edge. Uh, the cattle were given free reign on the on on all of uh, you know basically to all of these streams, and that was the first thing we did was remove the influence of cattle off of those streams. And then we got to work. So uh, we started with some of the smaller streams, the, the headwater streams that worked our way down to the larger streams. This is Hunt Bottom Branch. You can see the, the original uh, ditched uh, straightened stream corridor right there that we backfilled from the basically the priority one natural channel design that, that Dave Bottlesbach and his team helped to design. You can also see the use of on-site local materials uh, such as hay bales that we that we harvested right there on site, sod mats that we that we harvested right there on site. So we used as much local material as we could, and then you can kind of see it from the air, <clears throat> the end result. We didn't always fill all of the uh, straightened channels. Sometimes we uh, simply uh, blocked them with plugs and made them into adjacent uh, uh, habitat for amphibians and snakes and whatnot. Um, if we didn't need to just completely fill it. So some, some, some of the, the remnant uh, channelized features are still out there, but they're not flowing water anymore. And this kind of gives you some idea of what it looked like when we're all said and done in combination with the, uh, with the wetland restoration around it. Uh, the landscape responded very quickly to what we're doing out here. This is Ragsdale Creek when we started on the initial um, uh, construction and live stake installation. We harvested live stakes on site of willow, black willow and cottonwood and installed those. And then over time, uh, well, not much time in the, in the case with Ragsdale only took about a year. Uh, uh, those stakes, you know, just came on like gangbusters. And, <clears throat> and we also mixed in a native seed mix harvested locally of uh, riparian corridor um, uh, grasses and sedges and whatnot and and and, uh, and use that as an understory. But the big one, the big uh, challenge on the entire ranch was willow branch, which we called the branch that ate the ranch. This was the biggest environmental catastrophe that we had on the ranch when we got there. You can kind of see 
how this channel had had severely eroded in major rainfall events. Agriculture, including cotton, was just right up to the edge of this channel along much of its much of its reach, and you could see trees falling into it. And everything it was a uh, it was uh, quite a mess. Uh, Andrew, uh, uh, who's standing, Andrew Nomet, who's standing there looking at it, I, I could see the the exasperation on his face when we were first looking at this at this challenge, how we were what, how we were going to restore this, what we we're going to do to it. Fence lines were falling into it. It was a complete mess. And it went straight to the Red River. So you can see these two uh, yellow uh, uh, arrows. Uh, here's basically showing you the pathway for Willow Branch when we got there. What we figured out was that the landscape had clues that showed us that the original path of the channel was actually much longer and was parallel to uh, the Red River and originally uh, originally uh, tied into a remnant piece of, of Willow Branch Channel that went to uh, Bodark Creek and then into the Red River. So about another two miles over time, that two miles had been cut off in one way or another through channelization uh, uh, in, in order to get that water to the Red River as quickly and efficiently as possible. Our design was quite bold. Uh, it was to put it back to where it originally was on the landscape. And so we did. Um, this was the biggest construction project, as you can imagine. Uh, we, we, we basically took that originally eroded channel. We moved it back up on its floodplain. Uh, Dave and his team of designers right-sized it for that purpose, and we revegetated it. And then the, uh, the, cha the, the uh, channel next to it, we plugged in about eight different places in order to con con construct a string of, of, of ponds, almost like a string of pearls on a necklace out there beside this, uh, this new willow branch. Here's where Willow Branch was originally going into the Red River. The Red River is to the north on this photo. Uh, there's the original stream channel. There's our borrow area that we used. We actually filled that channel and cut it off from the Red River, turned it 90 degrees, Dave, and pointed it east towards its original, original channel system, which you can see in this photo, at the top of the photo, those wooded, that little wooded area right there is an old oxbow off of Willow Branch, which we basically reconnected. And you can see more of them in the background as you go all the way off the top of the photo. It was like a dash, a series of dashes that we just reconnected into a, into a line. And there it is in October 2020. And you can see it as it is flowing water and reconnected to its original system downstream near Bodark Creek. Uh, life just popped. I mean, we saw vegetation come back. Uh, in just a couple of months, it was it was really really spectacular to see that channel in action. And there is May, uh, Dave, when we had a pretty good pretty good rain out there and stable and flowing trees are growing out there on the landscape. It looks good. So, uh, in the interest of time, I will pursue the lessons learned very quickly. Uh, I, I love this saying by Juvenile: Never does nature say one thing and wisdom another. I'm going to start with the, the, the project. So uh, first of all, <clears throat> we did learn a lot about how to do a contract. That was the contract. That is the contract that that sits on my desk at, at res. Uh, you know, it, it's basically something I, I, I grab every day, like my Bible and read through it. Um, it's yeah, about eight inches thick. We learned we learned, though, that by taking on all of the risk and doing a turnkey project for North Texas Municipal Water District, it was a win-win. It was a win for RES. Uh, we got a large multi-year project, uh, which is fantastic for keeping people employed. And they were able to transfer a lot of their liabilities and risks for the success of the project over to RES contractually. And so far, so good. That's been a win-win in uh, the agencies uh, who issued those permits, including the Corps, are quite happy with the results. We also learned that 
in order to get up to scale, you have to order a lot of plants. As I talked about before, 6.3 million trees. Uh, we had to order a lot of those in advance, even before we had a signed contract in order to make sure we had the supply we needed to meet the construction schedule. So there was a lesson learned. The other thing we learned was <clears throat> it's a lot cheaper to use on-site materials and you, and, or, or closely, closely sourced materials and you use what you can. So a lot of the, the material that was actually, the, especially the trees that were being cleared in the reservoir for the lake, we were able to pull up to the mitigation site and incorporate into our structures in the stream restoration and into various habitat structures that we created just across the landscape. Uh, we also locally sourced our rock from Oklahoma, from a quarry in Oklahoma, which, which made that a lot easier to get down to river by. Uh, we used a lot of hay from on site. Uh, before we completely eradicated um, non native pasture lands out there, we, we gleaned as much of the uh, hay as we could, and we used those structures for erosion control and in our, uh, and in our uh, stream uh, restoration itself. And then uh, we had to use the right tools. The whole, the whole ranch was run off of wireless base stations and all the equipment was run from GPS. There were no rod people standing in front of the equipment. Everything was done with the designs loaded into the equipment and the operators running right off of the design using, using a 3D uh, GP, uh, using GPS to, to construct those 3D designs. Uh, lots of other things. We got, we got to use lots of toys, so I, I'll, uh, in the interest of time, I'll keep moving. But, but uh, I did talk about your concurrent design with construction, the need to stay very flexible in the design because it was iterative as we went along. Uh, but I do want to get on to the fact that not everything went perfectly. Um, this is a, a casualty of a controlled burn out of control. I think, I think it was controlled burn or maybe it was a catalytic converter going awry. Uh, and pretty representative of some of our, some of our uh, uh, trials and errors, I should say, out there on the ranch. <clears throat> not every channel looked the way we wanted it to. When we were done or as as we as it had been designed and so we had to go back and reconstruct uh, uh quite a bit as we were going along but for the most part more things went right than they did wrong there are several things we learned about uh, you know uh, trial and error wise Weather was quite unpredictable out there. There were some, sometimes we would have seven to 10 inches of rainfall in a single event. Uh, we'd had hail, we had snow, we had all kinds, we've had drought, we've had all kinds of unpredictable weather that we've had to adjust to and go back and either replant uh, vegetation that were casualties of that weather or reconstruct areas that hadn't quite vegetated yet that, that, uh, uh, that were impacted by that weather. We learned that there was quite a diversity of soils on that ranch, clays, silts, sands. Groundwater does weird things out there on that ranch too, because most all of it is built on alluvial soils that were laid down over millennia by the Red River. So we had to adapt to the different soils. We had to move some of our original plans around habitat wise. It's a very complex landscape and we learned that even though we had an initial mitigation plan that looked like this layout here of these different habitat types, uh, the greens are forested uh, wetlands, the, uh, the pinks are grasslands, the yellows are emergent wetlands, the oranges are upland forests, and the blues are uh, uh, scrub shrub areas. Uh, over time, as we constructed the different sections, uh, you know, that was the mitigation plan, our 90% design took that mitigation plan and made it a little more uh, uh, heterogeneous, I guess you could say, um, instead of homogeneous. It went from 355 GIS polygons to 449 GIS polygons just in the 90% design based on our additional site investigations. Uh, but then even after design and implementation, we did adaptive management <laughs> and it got even more complex. And then uh, eventually all the way to today, uh, what we call the Operation Monet where we are today, even, even more complex. So mother nature kind of 
schooled us as we were out there, told us where these habitats really wanted to be. Sometimes uh, a grassland just wouldn't, didn't want to be, it, where we wanted to put a grassland just didn't want to be a grassland, it wanted to be a wetland uh, and vice versa. Sometimes upland forest wanted to be wetland forest and vice versa. So we listened to the land and we adapted. Uh, fortunately, the mitigation plan was flexible enough to allow us to do that. Uh, all that work over four years and things are responding very quickly. Uh, the trophic system is starting to rebuild itself out there from the ground up with insects. Uh, we've got a lot of monarch butterflies out there, amphibians of all kinds of different species, which is really cool. Non-venomous and some venomous, uh, some more cantankerous uh, uh, reptiles. Bird life has just exploded out here on this ranch and the other two mitigation sites, but especially at River By, where we have we get to. Uh, see just an incredible amount of passerines, uh, waterfowl and predator and uh, uh, apex predator species like hawks and even eagles uh, out here at the ranch coming back after after four years of restoration. Heck, we've even seen pelicans coming up on the ranch. We have one avian ecologist, a, uni uh, a University of North Texas master's student, uh, Tessa Boucher, who has cataloged over a hundred and 80 different bird species on the ranch, including this um, uh, 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 endangered interior lease term, federally endangered interior lease term. There's a, quite an assemblage of mammals coming back on that ranch as well. Our game cameras capture some, some crazy things. Uh, this is a little juvenile bobcat. Our game camera, I thought, I think uh, caught that bobcat's mom coming back with a squirrel. Uh, pretty cool what we're able to see out there. But I'll wrap it up with this. Um, the people have been the greatest lesson learned for me on this project. So we lived and breathed this project for years. We've had some of the best people, including Dave Skittles Attic. I still love that picture, Dave, uh, that, that have just come together as a community and helped us construct this project. We've had designers, we've had graduate students, we've had singer-songwriters like Kid Lyon. We've had, <laughs> we've had I, mean, I mean, people fixing problems, uh, people coming up with big ideas like Lee. I think it was Lee's idea to do Willow Branch the way, or the way we did it, Dave. Um, yeah, correct. Probably 12 different disciplines of people that have come together to make this project work. Um, everybody from from you know from designers and engineers to ecologists, restoration ecologists, but also um, uh, finance folks, our construction teams, like like our planting teams, like these pictures. Uh, but also, um, oh yeah, yeah, no, uh, we had a lot of fun in the process. Uh, contracting, let me see if I can get to, yeah, here we go. Local staff that we hired there from Fannin County who were thrilled to actually not have to go all over the country to work. Some of these were pipeline construction operators that we hired directly um, that didn't have to leave and go out on the road uh, for extended periods of time. Uh, uh, Daniel Camper, who ran the entire operation. I mean, just just tons and tons and tons of really dedicated and smart people with all kinds of different backgrounds coming together to make these projects, to make this project a success, I should say. Uh, <laughs> including, including the core and their wildlife management skills, which is pretty dang funny. Uh, so, Long story short, we've had a lot of really great people with a lot of really great skills coming together in order to make this project uh, a success. And I, I can't say enough good things about all these folks. Um, living life with them has been a blast. So where are we going from here? The future. Uh, 
we've got monitoring and maintenance to do. Actually, this is this was as, as of June that, that says 95% complete, but really right now we're we're 100 complete we're training we've transitioned to monitoring and maintenance we've still got a lot of monitoring that we do out there we monitor every quarter on the ranch um, we've got a lot of maintenance to do including control burns that we do in order to keep the vegetation uh, fresh but the real future is growing up on the ranch as we speak so we've got a whole generation of kids that have come out here uh, and, and spent a lot of time on the ranch, either either born <laughs> during the project or growing up during the project, Dave, as a lot of yours did. <laughs> and it's fun to see the, the, uh, the flame of imagination lit in these little eyes as they see this project come together and they, wa and they watch their moms and dads working on this project. I cannot wait to see what these kids do when they grow up. So we're not done. And with that, I think I'm a little over 30 minutes a day, but I'm happy to take questions. Good, yeah, no, we'll, we'll leave it open for questions here and uh, see if anybody kind of chimes in and has a, has a question for Matt. If not, I'll, I'll ask you a question or two just to make you feel uncomfortable. Oh, that's, that's great. Uh, you won't make it awkward at all, Dave, I appreciate it. <laughs> I have, oh, I'm going to throw a softball out there. Uh, maybe, maybe with this group, this might, this might start some interesting conversation. What did we do with the beavers? Does anybody want to know? High speed lead poisoning. Yeah, Brad. Uh, that, so I, I'll, I'll bring this up because this has been something I've been struggling with for the last five years. We're still stuck in the need to check boxes with these Corps of Engineer with this Corps of Engineers permit. We need so many acres of forested wetland. We need so many acres of emergent wetland. We need so many acres of native grassland. We need so many linear feet of streams, and those streams are expected to have a single channel. Uh, and not have not not be a great big wetland. The beavers don't respect boxes very well, uh, unfortunately. And in order to maintain compliance with the permit and checking those boxes is not always conducive to have beaver uh, in your newly constructed stream channels, which to me now as project manager, I haven't watched this for five years. I'm kind of bummed about that. I'd like to see the regulatory uh, drivers for these projects flexible enough to allow for um, uh, native ecological seral stages to continue on without dinging a permittee for not having X amount of this habitat versus X amount of that habitat. So if beavers wanted to go in there and, and uh, do their thing and, and help to slow down water through some of these stream systems, I sure would like to have, I sure would like to be able to um, allow that without having to manage it quite so much as what we've had to do on this project. Just my thoughts. Gosh, I usually you throw the beaver word out there and people go nuts. I can't believe it. everybody's really quiet. I guess it's still too early. Matt, comments on hogs? Tons of hogs. Um, it is in our contract to control invasive species and that includes feral hogs. And if you've ever been to Texas, you'll know we are overrun with feral hogs. Their, their range has expanded, especially in the last 20 years to pretty much the entire state. River by Ranch is no exception. We have a terrible feral hog problem, uh, which we actively engage. We have, we have harvested over 2000 feral hogs out there to date. And we continue to actively do that every single day. Uh, so we keep them at bay, Brad. The damage we keep to a minimum. And if we weren't putting that much pressure on them, uh, I can guarantee you there would be probably hundreds of acres of rooted up habitat out there uh, that those feral hogs would destroy. I have a lot of them. I have a lot of feral hogs in my freezer right now, actually. <laughs> which I'm which I'm going to be using for for Christmas and for Thanksgiving this year. 
It tastes great. Matt, I have a question about uh, the planting of those trees. Yes, I, how did you do a million trees a year? And then where do you where did you get all your nursery stock? I just can't even imagine uh, yeah. that number. It's a pretty amazing number. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, Matt. So you know, I mean, Res had been operating. We've been we've been operating. We started in Louisiana, and we're 15 years old. So you know, 10 years we were 10 years 10 years old when we started this project. So we had some really solid relationships with some larger nurseries uh, in Louisiana and Texas that would that would contract grow for us. So before the project started, we had the species list. We got those nurseries to go out and collect the seed within the region, you know, of where we were going to be doing the project. And they just started contract growing uh, bare root seedlings. It was a huge risk on our part. We, we put a lot of money in there before we even had a contract. Uh, but we knew if we didn't, we wouldn't have the initial, we, we wouldn't have the supplies to be planting that, that you know, 6.3 million number by the time it was all said and done. So it was, it was a, it was, a, it was a whole procurement machine that we set up in the background, um, just out, you know, you know, uh, kind of outside of everybody's uh, uh, vision when we started the project. Uh, but our, but our Louisiana nursery and operations teams got that ball rolling uh, before we even signed the contract. And then, and then the planting itself, the way that we were able to get that many trees into the ground every season, we prepped the ground with what we call rips. So you would take, you would take this tractor, I uh, had a picture of it in there, and they would literally, let me stop sharing. They would literally uh, rip rows for these trees. They would, they would, they would use 16 inch, um, tines in order to go down in the soil and break up the plow pan in those fields where we plant the trees. That made it easier for the for the planting crews to get the bare root seedlings in the ground. But the trick to getting that many trees in the ground was, was literally manpower. We would have 30 or more individuals working over the winter and every one of those guys could plant about 2,000 trees a day by mm -hmm. hand. And so you add it up, 60,000 trees a day or so uh, over the course of about two months, we were able to get a lot of trees in the ground in a short amount of time. I've never planted 2,000 trees in a day. I watched them and <laughs> I, I think I would be dead by the end of the day doing what they did because they used a dibble bar. But uh, I mean, some of these guys made it look like, look like, nothing they were they were very very good at getting trees in the ground and they and they did it they did it right i mean they didn't just you know these trees didn't die i mean they 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 didn't jay hook them or they put them in the ground right but they could do it so fast it was almost like they didn't stop uh they would just walk a line every third step the double bar went in the ground and by the time they they were midway through that step, they had the tree in the ground, and then the as they ended the step, they they stepped on the on the uh, you know where they planted the tree in order to in order to compact the soil back against the tree roots. It was just that quick. And these are the same these that's that group of of planting uh, that planting team. <clears throat> they're out of the same region of Mexico. They worked for Res for ten years. So it's the same group that we bring back every year to plant our trees. I got a question. How do you go on from a project like this to something else? Because you described it as such a full scale thing where you're living on site, your kids are coming out, you're seeing total habitat uh, restoration. Uh, yeah. In one sense, it seems like climatic. How do you even move on from this? Oh, that's a good question, Tim. I, I think I'm still in that in that mode right now. Uh, as far as moving on from this project, I think like like a kid, I'll always somehow be tied to this project. You know, I sort of feel like a parent here. Um, the kid may be grown and about to go to college, but still needs support. We will be monitoring this this project until all of the performance criteria are met required in the permit. And so that may mean we're out here for 15 years, 20 years, 
it could be longer. So um, we're not done. Yeah, we will continue on the project for for many, many years until the Corps of Engineers agrees in writing that the permit requirements have been satisfied for the mitigation. And it's really only then that res will demo and be gone off the project and, and it gets turned over to some other entity. Uh, so I, I've got a little bit of a, I've got a little bit of time to kind of uh, uh, wean myself off this project, um, but I don't think I'll ever really completely move on from the project. There are other things out there. Um, speaking of, of, you know, a climax uh, type of type of project. The good thing about a project of this scale is you you do have the luxury of learning so many lessons and figuring out how things can be done more efficiently and effectively and growing really good teams of people in the process. Uh, we have been able to uh, move those folks on to other projects and, and take those lessons learned and apply them to other projects of scale. And we'll just continue to do, you know, to, to, do, to do even better and bigger projects in the future. Uh, one that I will mention, I don't know if you follow the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, but the Klamath River in uh, Oregon in Northern California has four dams on it, 300 miles of salmon fisheries that were cut off by those dams. Uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission last week gave the order to take those dams down and RES is the restoration contractor on that job. So we'll be doing quite a bit of river restoration behind those dams and uh, uh, riparian uh, habitat restoration along, the, along, the, along that river. Uh, and a lot of the lessons we learned on River by we will be taking, or on Bodark, we will be taking to the Klamath project. Dave, they already took the they took the, the construction trailers that we lived in and they moved them up there already. They're in Northern California now. Oh, good. Yeah, we recycled them. Matt, that's incredible. Um, that project I've been involved when I was an undergrad at Davis with working with some of the tribes up there, yes, and sir. and with some of the green sturgeon and salmon issues, you know, with the tribal folks. <laughs> Do you know much about the complex nature of the stakeholders and that project in particular between the farmers, ranchers, tribes? Can you tell us in a nutshell what's going on there and how they managed to come together? Yeah, yeah. Um, that I might be for you. a little bit more on a different week, <laughs> but you can say <laughs> quick. <laughs> I'll keep it really short and, and it would be a good segue and to maybe get Dave Kaufman to, to give you an update, Bottle Spock, if you get reached yep. out to Kaufman. Uh, but but it, long story short, Matt, yes, we are very aware of, of how complicated it is. And we have been involved in that project for over four years as well in the planning stages of that project. So we're 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 mobilized. We're up there. We have staff. We have dedicated staff, project staff on that on that project right now. Uh, we have engaged the Yurok tribe and several other tribes. I, I can't remember all the names that are now we're we're subcontracting uh, to to in order to develop uh, native seed stores in order to collect native seeds and develop native native plants for propagation, for putting in the ground once the dams come down and start coming down. So yeah, we're we're engaged and we do appreciate how complex it gets with the <coughs> other water users out there. That one's gonna be historic, obviously. Largest dam removal project in the world. All right, Dave, I think we've we've exhausted the questions. Hey, hey, thank you very much, Matt. Really appreciate it. Thank um, y'all. Appreciate y'all having me on. All right. So appreciate everybody. Hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving week. We're going to move on to the inspirational uh, part of the talk, but wanted to say happy Thanksgiving to anybody that uh, runs out of time, ran out of time or has to get off the line here. Uh, and then we're going to introduce another Matt, Matt Kondratiev, uh to talk to us today about a... Uh, well, we're just going to have a discussion back and forth. Matt, do you have an opportunity to turn on your screen today? Yes, here we go. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So uh, Matt's been a, a close friend for years. Uh, 
we get to share life together as a family on on a level at different times. Um, and today, Matt, what are we gonna what are we gonna be talking about in our discussions? Well, I just was thinking with Thanksgiving week um, coming on it right now. I just I was thinking a lot about just uh, all the different things I have to be thankful about, and um, what are the what are the blessings that I have in my life? I've just been sort of reflecting on that. I'm sure you have been too, um, people on the line. Um, so really, um, I just say, had all I have is is kind of a a couple of uh, verses that were kind of I think special to me in thinking about thankfulness, and you know we could share those. And then Dave, whatever you had in mind in terms of an interview, Good. you had something in mind. Well, let's let's get started with a quick word of thanks uh, and a quick prayer, and then we'll uh, uh, move on to kind of a discussion uh, with Matt. So, uh, dear God, thanks for this time together this morning. Uh, thanks for Matt and Matt. Uh, thanks for us opportunity to share knowledge and insights that we've that we have been able to learn over the years. Uh, help us to be truly thankful for the opportunities and relationships that we have in our life, and help us to be able to see you bigger than what we've seen you in the past. We're thankful, and help us to be more thankful. Amen. All right. So, Matt, thankfulness. Um, when you grew up, uh, when you had the difference between Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, what was little uh, eight-year-old Matt Kondratiev, what was your thought about Thanksgiving compared to Christmas? Yeah, I mean, growing up in my family, um, we had Thanksgiving was always about a lot of people coming together in my family. We have a big gregarious family. Um, so it was, it was very focused on relationships. Um, uh, my memories growing up were huge family gatherings, um, lots of laughter and, um, not, and not just laughter. I mean, there was also some things that, um, uh, it wasn't all positive, but most of it was like, it was, it was kind of Thanksgiving was mostly like kind of the time when, when a lot of people came together in my family, I got to see people that I didn't get to see, but once a year. Um, so in, in my growing up, Thanksgiving was, a, was all about relationships and people. And Christmas was tended to be more of a family focused thing, meaning my, my own small family. Uh, we tended to do more of a uh, kind of a just my mom and dad and uh, my siblings and maybe uh, a couple of people uh, on Christmas Day, but not nearly the number of people coming together, gathering. And, and um, I just have so many fond memories around Thanksgiving of stories uh, that people would share. Um, I had a lot of family that, you know, were former World War II vets. Um, uh, lots, of, lots of just incredible stories that I always got to hear and I always look forward to Thanksgiving for the social aspects of it. Yeah. So that was kind of my experience. Yeah. So, and, um, uh, did you have certain, uh, uh, yeah, traditions with families? Uh, did you have certain meals that you kind of kept as you always had every year for Thanksgiving? So you always had Turkey or did you have certain sides or accompaniments that you, that you focused on as a family that you look forward to every year? Absolutely. Yeah. We always had certain, um, so my, my background, if you probably wouldn't surprise you, I'm, I have a Russian last name, but, uh, I had an interesting growing up experience. My dad was Russian. So we went, my, uh, my grandparents on one side were pure, you know, were first generation Russians. Um, and then, uh, came over from, so from Russia. Uh, and so we would have traditional Russian foods. I don't know if anybody would even know the names of a lot of these foods, but you probably heard of Pirishki. You probably heard of uh, uh, perhaps, I'm trying to think what else people would know, borscht, things like that. But we would have a big feast, like a literally four course meal around um, the holidays uh, with my Russian side. Uh, and then on my mom's side, it was way more like, kind of we were Heinz 57 on that side so we had all kinds of uh different uh family backgrounds and folks from that but uh certainly um it would be interesting because we'd alternate and we'd either go to my grandmother's house who's Russian 
have our traditional four course meal with all the Russian dishes or go to my, uh, my mom's side, it would always be like Thanksgiving would be turkey and kind of things that probably most everyone knows, uh, green beans, hash rolls and all that stuff. So yeah, so lot, but lots of, so I had kind of a mix of uh, different types of foods around those holidays. Yeah, I've always thought it was interesting how, uh, you know, uh, Thanksgiving uh, as a holiday for us, you know, obviously was a, a fairly American holiday. There's a number of countries that have a Thanksgiving type holiday, um, but it's rooted around a table. Uh, it's rooted around the food around the table and kind of having this substance uh, to kind of share with others. Um, as you as you're getting older, uh, how has your thoughts of Thanksgiving changed from your younger thoughts of Thanksgiving? Is it kind of the same as what it was when you're younger? Is there a morphine of kind of this is how I view Thanksgiving now and this is how I interact? With this concept of Thanksgiving, or uh, has it has it changed significantly or not? Oh, I think it has. I mean, I think the probably the 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 biggest thing that has changed for me is just a thankfulness of the time that I get to share with those people I care and love uh, in my family, whether it's my kids or my my parents who are getting older. Um, including my wife's family, uh, my mom. Uh, so I, I guess just the preciousness of time and, 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 and uh, my age has kind of made me appreciate just the moments I get to share with them, really trying to um, relish, cherish, slow down, um, and, and take time to reflect on those things a little more, way more than, than what I would have as a, as a young person. Um, so I, I think, I think, yeah, it's definitely changed in the sense of, I, I feel like I'm, I have a more of a, I, I spend more time thinking about and reflecting on the value of these relationships, how blessed I am. And not just that, but even my community, right? The people I get to be my friends, uh, people like you and others that I get to share time with and share memories and do life with. So that's all part of that, I think. Yeah, I think about the uh, aspect of food um, and sharing kind of food with others out of kind of a tradition of thankfulness. Because, you know, growing up, I always thought of Thanksgiving as being, oh, that's kind of a glutton glutton uh, a holiday somewhere as really little because you just eat a whole lot and if you're bored eating and talking around the table you just gonna go upstairs and play underneath the couches and stuff uh, but um uh i i kind of i kind of look at that and say how does how does sharing a table uh give us an example of sharing love with others and how does thankfulness uh show serve as a catalyst for sharing love with others? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the idea that of, the, of the table, um, we've made it a priority in our family to have dinners together. We try to, as much as possible with busy schedules, I've got three, I've got one kid in college now and two high schoolers and one about to go into middle school. So um, life is busy, uh, but we have, tried as best as we can. Dinner time is, is always a priority to come around the table um, and to have that meal together. It's our chance to connect and talk with each other, share about our day, what we went through, any highs, lows, um, and, um, and really check in. So um, I think the table to me is a, is a symbol of fellowship and, and sharing, like you said, um, but it's an opportunity for, for connection with other people um, and, and, uh, and showing love to each other by, by not just thinking about ourselves. Because, right, I think in my job, I tend to go to work. I work around the computer all day, uh, staring at my screen and often on th items and tasks that are really related to what I do for the most part. 
And then when I come together on the table, it's, it's, it's coming out of that shell of kind of being so laser focused on what I am trying to accomplish and what I'm trying to do and be able to focus on other people and think about what their needs are, what they, what they have going on in their life. Um, so I'm not sure if that's where you're headed, Dave, but that's, that's how I see the tables. Uh, uh, I think of fellowship. Yeah. I was gonna say, I'm not really headed anywhere, just kind of conversations, uh, that we have. So I, I, you know, I, one of the things that I think about is I recently, uh, heard, you know, you know, and I've heard this a long time ago, but I usually recently typed this quote, which is a lot older quote from Brennan Mann, which said the single biggest cause of atheism in this world is Christians that acknowledge Christ with his, their lips and deny him with their lifestyle. And I believe that was in a old DC talk song years ago. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think about what the difference of acknowledging Christ opposed to sharing uh, Christ and sharing love with others uh, through a table is in the Thanksgiving season. Uh, it's kind of a Thanksgiving. I think of this concept of kind of slowing down and having a meal with somebody opposed to screaming from the side of the uh, the side of the street corner or screaming at the top of your lungs, hey, this stuff isn't going right. It's just slowing down and saying, hey, let's let's share love with the people around us. Let's have a meal together and let's see if we can't do life with a little bit more focus on thankfulness. Um, how is thankfulness uh, either, um, has, how, how is thankfulness affected your interactions with others, either when practiced or not practiced? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, it's not very hard for me to think about when I am, my heart is in a condition where I am uh, being thankful in my heart that I am focused on, you know, considering the blessings in my life. Um, and when it's not, because the quickest probably indicator, just like I think of a car and the check engine light or some other th indicators in our dashboard that come on, my easiest way is um, the, how I interact with my family at home. So uh, the close people I'm often closest with spend the most time with. Um, biggest check for me is when I feel like, and it's not very hard, um, I'm married. And when my wife tells me, hey, uh, honey, your, your volume right now, you're yelling. And, and honestly, my, I'm 48 years old. My hearing's starting to go. I don't think I'm yelling, but I get caught all the time by my wife. Hey, you, maybe you should tone it down. And I don't even think I'm really being that loud, but uh, uh, you can talk to my kids and my wife. Uh, the other, of course, you've heard me at conferences give talks. So I guess I have a pretty loud voice, a lot of you. Um, but anyhow, um, it's, it's often around the people that I'm closest with when I act grumbly or I am, I tend to, and it's not hard again for me to think about when I'm not being very thankful. It's, it's, it's when I'm grumpy, I get grumbly. Um, I start to, um, I don't know, think about the things that I'm uh, deficient in, whether that's finances or maybe just unmet expectations I think we all as people have certain like expectations and thoughts, obvious of what we think life should look like. And there's places in our lives where those things just don't match up with what we expected, you know, when we were five, 10 years ago, you know, in the past. And maybe even like some things that are hurt or things that like, man, I, want, I wish I had seen a little more progress in this area or that area in my life. I think we all have those areas. Um, and in varying degrees. And um, so when I focus on those things, I tend to be unthankful. I'm not being in my heart considerate of really all the things that were unintended or unexpected blessings. I think we can think of a lot of things that we didn't deserve or expect that are good things in our lives. Um, so to me, the, the check engine light on thankfulness is the way that I interact, treat my family uh, in particular. And, uh, and uh, the cool thing about having teenagers, they're extremely honest with you. 
So if you haven't ever had a teenager house, it's a great way to grow up or mature or kind of see, see yourself in the mirror because they're, uh, they're, they tend to be very, very blunt in the way that they, you know, you have conversations and discuss things. So, um, so anyway, I think my biggest way of thinking of, you know, am I in a thankful place is, is pretty easy because I've got uh, those family members that are constantly reminding me, dad, you're being grumpy. This, what, why are you so grumpy? Yeah. You know, that, <laughs> those kind of things. I guess I'm being pretty honest here, but I think it's, uh, it's, it works. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the case too. Sometimes we look at what's been done in the past for us or for others, and we kind of expect that to happen again. And if not, then it's almost like we've had a missed expectation. Uh, so we limit our thankfulness. When I think a lot of times our view of what's being done is so small compared to what actually has been gifted to us and what's being done that's outside of our control. So we lose sight of some of these little blessings and we don't live in the thankfulness for the little blessings. We spend our time uh, living in a thankfulness when we get a big blessing and then when we don't get the big blessing, we're like, okay, well, when's, the, when's this big blessing gonna come next? Uh, when's this big thing gonna happen? Opposed to just being able to uh, be thankful for all the things that we have been given in life. Totally. So Dave, can I cl conclude with just a verse that I think would encourage just the remaining folks that. out here? Yeah, I'd love that. All right, that. so this one is so good for me. And thank you for those of you who stuck around. Um, Psalm 103, written by David, King David. Um, I just want to read part of it. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his blessings or benefits who forgives all our sins, who heals all of our diseases, who redeems our life from the pit, who crowns us with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies our years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. And that verse to me is just so encouraging. It reminds me of all the amazing things that those of us who know God we know that he is really taking care of us on so many levels. And that, I mean, how much more thankful could I be if I'm just reminded of all of those incredible things that he's given and done for me? It's amazing. So if you have a second and you haven't read that passage, um, take a look at Psalm 103. It really is one of my favorites. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. I think it's, um, it's a key to remind ourselves of what we have to be thankfulness thankful for and then just practice thankfulness practice thankfulness for with others find reasons to say i thank thank you for something opposed to uh just looking at expectations and that's can be harder to do sometimes it slows us down a little bit but um well matt i really appreciate your time today with us and i'm very thankful for you being able to spend the time with us I, i'm thankful for your friendship and um, is there anything else that anybody would like to share today uh, before we end up closing out with a word of prayer? Is there anything that anybody needs some extra thoughts for or wants to give thanks for? All right. Dear God, just please help us to be amazed by you. Help us to live in ever more amazement. Help us to see ourselves smaller in this world than we've ever seen ourselves before. Help us to see others larger and you just infinitely larger than the others around us. Help us to be thankful for the air that we breathe. Help us to be thankful for the strength in our muscles. Help us to be thankful for a mind, help us to be thankful for friendship, help us to be thankful for all the little things that we take for granted and help us to be focused on you more and see you larger. We're amazed by you. Amen. Amen. Hey, we'll see you, brother. Have a great week. Thank Have you. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving. 
All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Matt Stallman. Thanks for your talk to this week. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Matt. Y'all have a good one. Matt, I hope to meet you someday. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm sure we're going to cross paths sooner or later, Matt. I'll take care. Have a okay. great time. See you guys. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Hey, thank you, Dave. Are you going to get home or not? Are you going to be in South Dakota with the family? Oh no, I'm just I'm just up here today with um, uh, with Jack, and then uh, we're looking at some stuff. Ron Coth started working with us. I know. Uh, you told me that. And uh, That's so awesome. We're moving over a computer to Ron, and then looking at a couple projects with him, and then we'll should be home this afternoon. So it's not too far away. It's just Rapid City. So nice. Well, good. We'll have a safe trip, Dave, and, and we'll be, yeah, let's be in touch. If you're, if you're around these coming, you know, during the holidays or whatever, let's get together for lunch. Yeah. I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd like to do that. Maybe sometime next week. If there's a, if there's a day that kind of works for your schedule, let me know and we can see if we can make, arrange. Something. That would be fun. I'd love that. So. All right. Hey, we'll see you, man. Have a great day. Buddy. All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.